Hello. They're Colson. And she's Sarah. And we're here to talk about gender Gender schemas. schemas. Let's break it down, shall we? Okay. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about a guy named Jean Piaget. In 1923, he applied the concept of a schema to the field of psychology. It's used to describe a group of ideas or actions that fit together. To understand how we think about schemas, let's take dragons as an example. Now, two people's schemas of dragons may be the same, or they could be very different depending on a variety of factors like culture, nerdiness, and so on. If you're from the West, when I say dragon, you may think of a four-legged, two-winged reptilian creature who breathes fire and can fly. However, if you're from the East, you may think of dragons as four-legged serpentine figures who hold a pearl or an egg in one hand and are really intense. Intelligent. These are usually viewed as more benevolent or positive than their Western counterparts. However, the tricky part about schemas is that if something doesn't fit into your expectation, you're likely to reject the idea that it could possibly be included in that category. Okay, so now gender. Take a look at this awesome image of the genderbred person that summarizes and explains the traits and differences between identity, expression, sex, and attraction. For now, we're just going to focus on the first three. The wall four are important. Gender identity is your internal view of yourself. Gender expression is how you outwardly portray yourself. And biological sex refers to your sexual organs, like testes and ovaries. So you can be a person who is female sexed, identifies as male, and presents as androgynous. Or you could be a male, identifies as male, and presents as male. Neither of these are better or more valid than the other. They just are. Gender schema theory was developed by Sandra Bem in 1981. It's a cognitive theory that explains how individuals are grouped by gender. Gender schema just means that it's a set of ideals or expectations that define the concept of gender. Where things get really messed up is in that rejection aspect, so that when people don't fall into the constraints of society's gender schema, it can go badly. We can think of an example just from this past year. A transgender team named Leela Alcorn committed suicide. And in her note, she talked about her parents' rejection of her and the societal pressure fitting into gender categories she didn't align with. As you can see, it's really critical that as educators of teens, we understand the gender schema of the Western world so we can prevent tragedies like these from happening. So to understand this, we have to go a little bit deeper into the theory. We have two predominant genders here in North America, man and woman. Within these, there are subcategories like tomboy or butch, but for the most part, these are still accepted in the general dichotomy. However, within the LGBTQ community, there are actually a ton of different genders. Including mine. I'm somewhere between agender and androgynous, which is not falling into any category, and gender fluid. Which means on some days, Colson likes to present as female, and on other days, they like to present as male. You may have noticed that I've been using the pronoun they to describe them. Because I go through periods of something called gender dysphoria. It means I'm fundamentally uncomfortable with being my sex, female, and prefer to go by neutral pronouns. And this started manifesting when you were in Sec 1? Yep, so that means you, as teachers, can easily have transgender students starting to identify in your classes. Transgender, by the way, just means that your gender identity does not match your assigned sex. Anyways, back to gender schema. So sex typing is categorizing others and yourself based on the gender schema. So the ideas and connotations that you've built up over the years define men as masculine and define women as feminine to you. We learn these categories through our environment, family, media, and society at large. As a social learning theory, gender schema shows us how we learn gender role behaviors by imitation. We are rewarded and punished in our conformity to socially normal behavior. However, schemas of any sort are not unmodifiable nor inevitable, and this is very important for us to know as teachers. But gender schema is self-fulfilling. The more you buy into the construct of gender normativity, the more you remake it as normal through your judgments on yourself and others. So let's look at 007 here. He falls into a lot of traditional masculine categories. Ruggedly handsome, short hair, lethal, cool, unemotional, muscular. And he gets the girl. Well, let's just say he's virile. Masculinity is the expectation that is then projected and internalized on those bodies marked as male. And taking a look at this Bond girl, we can see she's traditionally beautiful. And my god, does she ever make a good sidekick. An important feature and asset of the stereotypical Western woman. Fashionable, female intended clothing like a bikini. And she has long, well-kept hair. She's smiling. And women, as we know, are considered more outwardly emotional and emotional in general than men. 
don't get us wrong, nobody really thinks all of these stereotypes are true for every single person. And but some things are still slow coming. Acceptance of more than just the gendered binary is still in the early stages. This is where you come in. So science doesn't think people are born with a gender schema imprinted on them. It's something they learned. By the time we meet our students, the schema's pretty much been set in place. The consequences of gender schema on young people are well documented. Edward W. Morris documents it in his book, Learning the Hard Way. He specifically explores the pressures put on young boys and how those expectations actually drive the dropout rate up for young men. And while girls may traditionally excel more in school, according to the literature, we can easily see how young girls and women are devalued, like in this clip about quote unquote, acting like a girl. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Oh Show me what it looks like to fight like a girl. <laughs> now throw like a girl. Aww. So do you think you just insulted your sister? No. I mean, yeah, insulted girls, but not my sister. Is like a girl a good thing? Actually, I don't know what it really, if it's a bad thing or a good thing. It sounds like a bad thing. It sounds like you're trying to humiliate someone. There's not too much we can do about kids absorbing the societal gender schema. But we do have control over our own classroom. We took what the literature says we can do and pushed it a little further. A lot of authors merely suggest avoiding stereotypes about men and women and including positive representations of both in the curriculum. And of course, both of these things are important, but we would like to suggest a more transformative approach in which we can really interrogate the construction of gender. So tip one, be aware of your own gender schema. So the BEM sex role inventory was also developed by Sandra BEM, and it characterizes your personality as masculine, feminine, androgynous, or undifferentiated. The BSRI is based on gender stereotypes, so what it's actually measuring is how you fit into your traditional gender role. And we've included a link to the test below this video for you to take. It will at least identify whether you have any major biases that you may not be consciously aware of, which is critically important as a teacher. Having a bias isn't a bad thing. Like we said, by the time kids are in Sec 1, they've already absorbed the societal gender schema. What is important is owning your biases, making sure that you're not accidentally discriminating as a facil facilitator and authority figure in your classroom is crucial to changing the cycle. For example, make sure you don't treat boys and girls or in-betweeners differently just based on their identity or gender. Tip 2. Make a safe space. Make sure your kids know it's okay to be whatever gender or orientation they want in your classroom. Shut down any bigotry and start this classroom atmosphere from day one. Don't back down. Trans kids are likely to be bullied and this is our responsibility. Okay. Tip 3. Stop using gendered language. An easy thing to do is just integrate gender neutral terms into your examples. Your math problems can be Jill and her partner and refer to your class with gender neutral terms like okay class and all right everyone. Of course we're not saying never acknowledge gender in your examples or when referring to students. They is a really inadequate gender neutral pronoun, especially if you have ESL students. Just mix it up ever so often and eliminate it where you can. Tip four. Get rid of stereotypes! But you already knew that. Basically, don't let anyone fall into the trap of science and math fields being quote-unquote too masculine and humanities being quote-unquote too feminine. ELA can choose a variety of texts that showcase non-stereotypical characters, which are usually more interesting anyway. Science, make sure you encourage girls who like STEM fields to pursue, to pursue it. Tip 5. Respect choice. Sometimes, kids might be going through a phase, but regardless of whether something is permanent or temporary, respect it. What's so dangerous about entrenched gender schemas is that they often preclude self-determination. Society tells you you must fall into these boxes, so people like Leela or even myself have to fight this uphill battle just to actualize ourselves as people. There are tons of other things you can do, and lots of resources you can check out in the links be below this video. And remember, just because it doesn't look like a dragon, doesn't mean it's not a dragon. Hallelujah. We're done. Go home. Hey, look, 757. Oh, I was the thing. No. Don't forget to save it. Yes, doing that right now.